who had to go away on business uh, for a few days and leave his young family. And he wanted to make sure his wife was okay. Um, so he said to his son, who was nine years old, um, when I'm away, can you think of the sort of things I would normally do around the house and do it for me to help out your mum? <laughs> he had in mind things like washing up and putting out the rubbish bins and things like that. Very good idea. His son happily agreed. And on his return, he asked his wife what the son had done. Well, she said, it was really strange. <laughs> Straight after breakfast, he made himself another cup of coffee, <laughs> went into the living room, put on some loud music and read the newspaper for half an hour. <laughs> The father was left thinking that perhaps his son had obeyed him, obeyed him a little bit too accurately. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me just start with that one. And uh, this story seemed appropriate this morning because the passage we're going to look at today ends with the sentence, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Praise God, you say, but it's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> it's sort of like, oh, really? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for that. <laughs> it was Jesus who said that, part of the Sermon on the Mount that we're continuing to look at um, as we go through this, this series. Part of the training um, and the discipleship that Jesus gives us so that we become more and more like Jesus, the perfect example unlike the father in the little story I told. Um, okay, so our main theme this morning is exceptional love and the golden rule. That's our main theme. And I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 5 and uh, verse 38 to 48. It's on the board or you can follow it in your Bibles. Um, so here we go. This is Jesus' teaching. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court, and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask, and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You've heard the law that says, love your neighbour and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies. Amen. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends the rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there in that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I think we better pray. <laughs> Father, Lord, save us and help us, Lord. <laughs> help us, Lord. Lord, this is your word, it's your life-giving word. We pray that we will have open hearts to receive and hear your word this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone has something to say about love, don't they? Poets, songwriters, celebrities, newspaper writers, everyone's got something to say about love. You may hear regularly something like, all you need is love, as the good book says. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't the good book that said that, it was Lennon and McCartney that said that. <laughs> Although there is truth in that. There is definitely truth in that. But we're going to need to understand a bit more, aren't we, about what Jesus had in mind when he talked about loving others. So exceptional love. Probably one of the most uh, famous phrases in the passage we've just read is where Jesus says, love your enemies, and Luke adds in his version, and do good to those who hate you. Now, the reaction to that here, as much as I would have expected, it was sort of, hmm. <laughs> Not a great deal of excitement. And more like sort of, yeah, we've heard that before, thanks. <laughs> well, 
Let me tell you, I was uh, teaching my first year in China. I was teaching English to postgraduates, Chinese students, and we were, I was doing a vocabulary lesson on the word love and the different ways in which we can use love in English. How that we can love our brother and sister, we can love a friend, we can love our husband or wife or our girlfriend or boyfriend. There's sexual love, romantic love. We love our dogs and our cats. And, and I then said, and Chinese people love to eat the dogs and the cats. <laughs> so, <laughs> which sadly was true. There are many, many ways that we use the word love. But we only have one word for it. We only have one word for that, and that's love. And uh, when, what Jesus was saying here was revolutionary. And when I said that to, to um, the class, when I said Jesus said, love your enemies, there wasn't a quiet sort of nodding. There was a gasp. It was literally, what? What did he say? Did he really say that? They had never heard that before, and it shook them. And the trouble is, in the so-called westernized, Christianized West, we're used to that kind of thing. But we don't necessarily do it, but we're used to it. <laughs> but when you come across a group of people who've never heard anything like that, it shocks them yeah. to say, love your enemies. What Jesus was saying here was revolutionary. In fact, it was a new kind of justice. It was a new kind of restoration and response to people and situations around them. The Old Testament idea was an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. That was good. That was the Old Testament law. It was designed to keep vengeance and retribution in check so it didn't sort of get out of hand. So vendettas and wars of revenge didn't just increase more and more and more. So the Old Testament was law, law was given to keep that. But Jesus went so much further. He said... No, yeah, that's fine, but that, that helps society keep a lid on violence and vengeance. But actually, I want you to love your enemies and do good to your enemies. So much further than the New Testament. This was new. This was the kingdom of God breaking in, in a new way, because Jesus has now come. This could be the start of a new community way of living. This could be the start of a new way of living that would start to affect society. How revolutionary is that? So what does Jesus mean when he uses the word love? Well, the ancient world, particularly the Greek world, had different words for different kinds of love. And uh, the Greeks, they knew about storge love, which was the normal natural love found in families between sisters and brothers and mothers and sons and daughters and that, that kind of thing. They knew about the eros love, from which we get erotic and eroticism, uh, which refers to the passion of romantic love and sexual love. They knew all about that. They knew about filio love, which was the camaraderie, the friendship between, say, members of a sports team, or a group or community, or the sort of band of brothers type of love, or the, the sisterhood type of thing. Thing you might find in the army, perhaps, amongst fellow soldiers. That kind of filio love. Jesus chose to use a different word to any of those. A word that was rarely used. It wasn't completely new, but it was rarely used because it was rarely seen or experienced. It was agape love. And this was a love that focused mainly on the recipient, on the person receiving the love. What was good for the other person? It was that kind of love. It included the idea of sacrificial giving of love that cost something to the person who was giving it. it. certainly wasn't based on the attractiveness or the merit of the person receiving the love. That was not the point. It wasn't that, oh, this is a lovely person, this is a personable, kind sort of person, I can like them, I can love them. It wasn't that type of love at all. Even the unlovely, the enemies and the haters are loved by this kind of love. Of course, it's the kind of love that God has for you and me in Christ. He doesn't love you because you've cleaned up, <laughs> because you've cleaned up your act somehow, or because you're somehow spiritually attractive or spiritually open. That's not why he loves you. Far from it. In fact, Paul writes, and he uses the same love word that Jesus used. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 
and uh, Pete uh, referenced this a bit uh, earlier on. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of what? Deserving of his love? No. Deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Totally unmerited favour. That is the love of God. And Paul goes on to say in Romans, in Romans 5, verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let that sink in. While we were still sinners, Christ did it all. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, because we were God's enemies, we didn't know it, many of us, some of us did, but many of us didn't know and realise we were God's enemies. While we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Hallelujah. It's only because of this kind of agape love, loving us even when we were like enemies to him, that we have any hope at all. God in Christ loves you despite it all, whatever the it is in your life. We all have those it's in our lives. (laughs) Despite it all, God loves you. And he wants that relationship with you as a father to his children. And therefore he sent his son, Christ Jesus, to sacrificially give himself to death, to pay the price for your waywardness and hardness and opposition to God, and to redeem you and reconcile you, you and me, to his family. That's the agape love that Jesus is talking about here. So when Jesus says, love your enemies... And do good to those who hate you. Don't take revenge. Don't bear grudges when people wrong you. Pray for those who seem to be against you. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Well, this is the kind of love he's talking about. The active love. Let's give ourselves a bit more guidance and help, shall we? (laughs) Jesus gave a wonderful story to help us and illustrate what love in action looks like. It's the story of the Good Samaritan, which many of you will know. Let me read it from Luke chapter 10. It's all very well playing the saxophone before you preach, but it makes you thirsty. (laughs) (coughs) A Jewish man was travelling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbour to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man who had started this whole conversation replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes. Now go and do the same. Jesus was telling this story because someone had asked him how he could get eternal life. In other words, how can I get what I want? And Jesus replied basically, well, he basically replied, love God, love your neighbour as yourself. That's basically what Jesus said. In other words, God first, others next, and then you. 
And that prompted the next question. The man was trying to sort of wriggle a bit and justify himself and said, well, who is my neighbour? He was kind of hoping he'd say, well, these nice Jews round here, they're your neighbours. <laughs> Nobody else, don't worry. Just these nice people, they're your neighbours. Um, and hence, Jesus tells that story. So a man was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and uh, the story assumes, in fact, it says that the man was Jewish, a Jewish man, and uh, that road from Jerusalem to Jericho, it was a bit of a dangerous road, particularly to travel on your own, um, and it wasn't that unusual uh, to be attacked, to be honest. And a gang of cutthroat robbers stripped him and beat him, leaving him severely wounded and half dead. Apparently, um, the way things worked, really, was if he'd not resisted, they would have probably just stolen stuff and gone on. So I guess the Jewish man resisted, and uh, the result was he got a, a, a real good beating and was left half dead. And uh, now we're going to meet three people who are also, by coincidence, passing by. Now you need to know that in Jerusalem, in the temple in Jerusalem, the temple was served by three classes of people. They were served by priests, and then under them, they were served by Levites, or temple assistants, and they, in turn, were served by laymen, lay people, who helped out in the general service and life of the temple. So there were three classes of people. And the first to come by was the top class, the priest. He was wealthy, he was respected, he was probably riding on a horse or a donkey because he could afford to. Everybody else would have had to have walked. And he saw the wounded man. And the man was naked, he'd been stripped. And uh, partly because of that, he couldn't work out what nationality he was either. And uh, thought, well, maybe he wasn't a Jew um, anyway. Maybe he was dead or would die very soon. He looked really in a really bad state. And the priest dared not touch him. Because if he touched him, he would become ceremonially unclean. And then he would have to go all the way back to Jerusalem, go through a whole series of ceremonies and purification rites, and if the man had actually died, that would have been even worse. He would have had to rend his clothes, spoil his nice new priestly robes. What a faff! What a nuisance! Can't be bothered with that. And anyway, if he wasn't a Jew, did he have to help this man anyway? All far too risky. So he, he walked by. Next along, came the Levite, the temple assistant. He walked by. Now, he probably knew the priest who had just gone ahead of him because it was a closed community in the temple, and uh, he could hardly upstage the priest, could he? He'd just gone before. I mean, the priest obviously knew the religious law far better than he did, and if the priest didn't help him, well, then I don't need to help him and probably shouldn't. Uh, and he didn't have any money anyway. He was, wasn't a rich priest. And uh, so what could he do? He couldn't help. He couldn't do anything. Best leave well alone and pass by. There's nothing I can do, he thought, uh, here. Nothing I can do that won't get me into trouble anyway. Um, and then came the third person. Now, Jesus' listeners would have expected the story to now say it was the temple layman, the layperson, the assistant in the, in the temple, who was next. But surprise, it's not. It's not a Jew at all who comes next. It's... A Samaritan. He's going to be the hero of the story. The despised, rejected, hated outsider is the hero. A good Samaritan helping a wounded Jew. It doesn't, just doesn't fit right. It's not what the listeners of the story would have expected. So the man, the Samaritan, he administers first aid with first aid with oil and wine. He puts him on his donkey takes him to an inn, which would have been in Jewish territory, would have been a Jewish inn. That was risky for a Samaritan man carrying a wounded Jewish man into a Jewish inn. A little bit sort of suspicious, isn't it? What are you doing with this man? How has he come to be wounded? And you're a Samaritan, we don't like you anyway. It would be very easy to jump to the wrong conclusions, wouldn't it? It looked very suspicious. And then at his own expense, he paid for the man's care and board and lodging. It was costly, it was risky was dangerous and it was an act on, act on behalf of the Jew by that Samaritan man. The Samaritan was helping the wounded Jew. The Samaritan became the neighbour to the wounded Jew. Many early church writers saw this story, saw the Samaritan as a Jesus-like figure coming in from the outside, 
not the expected figure, to save the wounded, to save the half-dead man. Without thought for himself, without thought for ethnic divides, without thought for hostilities. How like Jesus that is. He came from the outside. He was despised. He was rejected. They didn't recognise him. They weren't expecting him in that way. And he came to save not just Jews, but every single person from every tribe and nation across the world. Initially it was Jews and Gentiles, but they then went across the world to all nations. It was a costly demonstration of unexpected and unmerited love. But you've done nothing to deserve it. But the Samaritans saw with compassion and loved him. And Jesus makes the point, which is not so much about who is my neighbour, but how can we be neighbourly ourselves to others? The issue isn't who is our neighbour. The issue is will we be neighbourly? Will we love? What it means for us to be a good neighbour to others, whoever they are, whatever the inconvenience or the cost or the risk to ourselves, that's agape love in action, thinking of the other person. Another example that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 is what's often known as the golden rule. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. That's very often taken out of context. Did Jesus say this? Yes, he did. He said exactly that. But did he only say this? No, he didn't only say that. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. and Love your neighbour as yourself and do to others whatever you'd like them to do to you. It's a whole package. We love God, we love our neighbour, we do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This moves us along from just the theory of, yes, of course, as Christians, we don't hate people. We're nice people. We don't hate. We love our enemies, so we think. <laughs> we don't take revenge. We don't hold a judge. We, do, we don't hold a grudge, sorry. But this moves us to actually not just not doing things we know we shouldn't do, but actually doing things that we should do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Not, just doing, not just not doing what we know is wrong, but actually doing what is right. Yeah. It moves us along to love in action doing good to others regardless of what we think of other people. Whether they do good to us or not isn't the question. It takes us further into love in action. When we lived in um, Tajikistan, we got to know, um, well, we had a small group of um, ex-Muslims who'd become Christians, mainly very poor people, um, and uh, quite a lot of ladies amongst them. And because they become Christians, they tended to be rejected and despised by their families, sometimes thrown out of their families. And there was one lady who became very, very ill. In fact, she had a very serious stroke. And um, Muslimah was her name. And uh, she was very, very ill. And her family just basically wouldn't look after her. They said, oh, she's, a, she's a Christian. She's probably brought it on herself anyway because she's turned away from Islam. Um, and uh, uh, the only people who would care for her with a small group of Christian ladies who went into the house almost every day to look after her. In the end, they had to feed her, they had to wash her, she was incontinent, uh, she had a very, very serious stroke. The family said to these Christians, don't feed her, she's going to die anyway. The family said to these Christians, don't feed her, that only means she'll make more mess. Completely despised and rejected. It was the Christians who cared for her. They weren't going to get anything out of it except more insults and more uh, rebuke and more, more rejection, in fact. The lady passed peacefully into the presence of the Lord. And uh, we gave her a Christian funeral, the first Christian funeral that had taken place for centuries in that area, um, which was amazing and also caused a lot of trouble as well. <laughs> um, but, you know, that is love in action. I hear and see of people um, loving and caring and giving time and energy to one another here in this community here. I see it and I hear it. I hear of people giving their time to give lifts and uh, visit and take people to hospital and help out in all sorts of ways. And we don't do it because of what we get out of it. We don't do it because uh, we want to be applauded. That's why I'm not going to name anybody. Because, but I know it happens. I know it happens. 
And that's good. It's love in action. Jesus' words are incredibly challenging because they suggest that we should show love even when we may well get nothing back. In fact, we may actually get negative emotions back. Um, I don't know what obeying Jesus' commands here needs to look like for you. It's not really for me to say that in your specific circumstances. But I do think it needs to look like something. <laughs> something tangible, something practical. Not just cheering from the sidelines. <laughs> this week, let me, let me challenge you to pray and ask God to show you if there is any way he wants you to love or support or pray for or be kind to or help in some way someone who you wouldn't normally or naturally have time for or be interested in. <laughs> That's the challenge. Someone outside your comfort zone. Even someone perhaps who's upset you or hurt you or ignored you or misunderstood you or opposed you. How can you love or pray for them? How can you show God's kindness or love or help to them? There's a challenge, isn't it? But how, you say, how can I do that? <laughs> the question is, how can we? It seems so hard. How can we keep going? Do we even want to, perhaps, if we're really honest? <laughs> this teaching doesn't really work by me or anybody else just standing up here Sunday after Sunday saying, right, go out and love your enemies. <laughs> Some of you might think, well, yes, I want to do that, I should do that, I'll try that, I'll pray, I'll act on this. And you try for a week, maybe with some success, but it doesn't take long before you realise that um, perhaps you haven't treated that person very well, or perhaps you shouldn't have said that in that particular way, or you should have said something here, but you didn't say something, and you feel guilty, and you come back next Sunday, and you hear something similar, so you try again, but you don't do much better and you feel more guilty, and eventually you stop trying. It doesn't work, you say, or I'm not able, you say, or I can't, you say. It's just not me, you say. It works well for them, but it doesn't work for me. I can't love in that way. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many people ever feel like that. <laughs> help, we say. Help. It's a good prayer, by the way. Help. <laughs> We need help. We soon realise that this is not about us trying harder to obey God. Because that will never work. We were saved by grace as a gift. Before we did anything to deserve our salvation. And we go on living under grace and favour. Bearing fruit and living for him because of his grace. Because of his work in our lives. His power and our trust in the promises of good of God. There are two truths that I want to bring to us that might just help us. Oh, there we are, help. <laughs> First one is this. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I'm so glad Paul didn't stop there. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God is at work in our lives. If we will throw ourselves upon him and trust him, he will do the work in our lives. We'll have to cooperate, we'll have to obey, but he will work in our lives. We'll find the strength as we believe that God is at work within us. We live in Christ, full of his love, and he works in us so that his purposes are fulfilled. And then secondly, this other great verse from Romans chapter 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us, given to us. Meaning as we're full of the Holy Spirit, full of God, we find God's love in our hearts and that then overflows to others. If you want to know how to love, we'll be full of God's love. If you want to be full of God's love, receive the Holy Spirit. This brings great rewards. The blessings that are announced in the Beatitudes, to be blessed by God for the merciful, the peacemakers, to be known as sons and daughters of God. See God for the pure in heart. Love your enemies and your reward will be great. Luke Acts 
uh, Luke adds in his version. And in Matthew 5, it says, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. How do we win people? There are many ways. It includes our words, it includes our witness, it includes our story, but it also includes our good works. People will see and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Hallelujah. Let's, let me summarize and then we'll pray. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Agree? Yeah. That's what we should be doing. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that God's love for us in Christ is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even when before we were before we knew him, before we accepted him, before we understood he loved us and he goes on loving us. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you, the golden rule. But remember this, God is at work in us. That's what we rely on. We don't rely on our own strength. We don't say, yeah, I'm going to be a better person this week. Well, I hope you are. <laughs> but without God, I don't think it will last very long, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> be filled with the Holy Spirit and the love of God and let that love flow out to others. You know, just to use the analogy of the, uh, the fruit tree, the apple tree, you know, love is one of the fruits of the Spirit. A fruit tree doesn't have to strain to produce an apple. A fruit tree produces an apple because it's a fruit tree, because it's an apple tree. A pear tree produces a pear because it's a pear tree. <laughs> if you are in God, if you are in Christ, if you are a new creation, you will produce fruit if you let God work in your life. Also, just to continue the analogy, a fruit doesn't happen overnight. It grows from a, a tiny bud that becomes a flower that eventually becomes the beginnings of a fruit and, it, fruit and it's not even ripe for a long while yet either. It takes time for fruit to grow. So that's why we are being trained because we're growing in the fruits of the Spirit, particularly God's love. So the challenge was to pray and ask God to show you if there's any way in which he wants you to love or support or pray for or be kind to or help in some way, someone you wouldn't normally or naturally have time for or be interested in. <laughs> someone outside your comfort zone. Even someone who's upset you perhaps or hurt you or ignored you or misunderstood you or opposed you. How can you love or pray for them? How can you show God's kindness to them? Shall we pray? I think that would be good. <laughs>